Hey everybody, this is The Trout, a.k.a. Rick Troutman. Welcome to The Trout Share Podcast. You know what I do? I interview musicians that are located all over this wonderful planet of ours that are very talented. Some of them you'll know, and some of them you may not know, but one thing I will tell you, you'll know about their life in the music industry. So sit back, grab a cup of coffee or your favorite Edo beverage, and listen to our next episode coming up right now. Sweep me off my feet My American sweetheart And crash into me At some dirt road dive bar Kissing in the street Drive your 84 vintage sports car Wild and free Hey everybody, it's The Trout and welcome to another episode of The Trout Show Podcast. Thanks so much for stopping by. What you just got through hearing was a great singer-songwriter out of the Northeast. Her name is Lillian Ledbetter. And that song, American Sweetheart, is off her brand new album called State of Romance. Now Lillian sat down and talked to me about the album and how she started writing music. And very interesting, she grew up kind of out in the country, didn't have access to the internet, didn't have access to TV. So she really kind of wrote music about folk and Americana. Great album. I think you'll enjoy it, and I think you'll enjoy this upcoming episode of The Trout Show with Lillian Ledbetter, Americana folk singer. That's next on The Trout Show Podcast. Are you excited about your new album coming out and your release party yeah i mean how could you not be after you put so much time and energy into it you know well, how, how, have long like, have you work, how, how long have you been working on it well i've been working on the actual album itself for i guess almost about a year and a half now um i okay. finished it this past winter and then have kind of been preparing for the release um you know kind of envisioning what i want to do with it finally got cds in the mail so i have these for my release party so i'm very excited about that i wasn't even sure if i was going to do physical prints because of the world that we live in but there's something very satisfying about seeing things in the physical realm um so yeah i'm very excited uh levin in new hampshire that area uh i finished my um high school career in that area so i have a lot of ties there and um uh, yeah, the Anonymous Coffee House where I'm doing the show is just a great organization bringing live, free local music and free refreshments to that area. So very much looking forward to it. So is it you or are you bringing a band or what's what are you going to do? It's going to be myself and uh, a wonderful friend and musician of mine, Phil Cohen, is going to be joining me. Uh, we do like a little duo set together. Uh, we did a short tour up the East Coast from Nashville to Vermont um, for the release of the first single off of the album uh, in the fall of this year or no this yeah spring spring coming back up okay and um yeah so you know usually when on the road i do a bit of a duo setup uh it's kind of crazy to try to bring everyone including the harpist <laughs> on the road uh so yeah Ooh, duo, wow. duo harpist. Shows for this. cool yeah there's some tunes on there with some really beautiful harp by a wonderful woman named marie hamilton <laughs> so the one song that you wrote i think it's called sophia is that the one yeah. about Paris? Yeah. Yes. Have yeah. you ever been to Paris? I have been to Paris. In fact, the song is quite um, autobiographical, really. Um, after a, a lovely trip with my friend Sophia in Paris, I mean, truly, I'm not embellishing that much in this song. <laughs> um, I visited her and I had a really wonderful and expansive time and, and just... Uh, in the broader sense, a, a romantic experience where we, you know, walked, walked along the river and we went to art galleries and churches and right. drank wine in the streets and just like really ex experienced Paris in this way that's almost only pictured that way in movies and films and books. And so when I got home, um, I really didn't reflect on it that much. And then her birthday was coming about and I realized the day a day and a half before and I realized nothing that I could send her would get there in time unless I wrote a song real quick um so uh, I drank like half a bottle of wine I wrote the song <laughs> I sent it to her and she listened to it on the train the next morning um so that's kind of the origin story of Sophia it's it was truly it's a happy birthday note so well, when yeah. did you start doing that I think I started playing guitar 
um, probably when I was around 10 or 12, it was actually a little bit later, um, singing really preoccupied the majority of my time. And I was really interested in, you know, folk music and acapella folk music. And I got really into um, choral music as well. And I was in a lot of choirs when I was younger. I really loved harmonizing with other people's voices and kind of the grandiose um, feeling of being in a choir. There's nothing quite like feeling your voice Mm -hmm. against other voices. No, there's not. So I was really into, um, you know, my dad was playing guitar, so I had the accompaniment uh, right there, you know, and um, he was learning kind of when I, after I was born, his sisters gave him a guitar for his birthday. And um, he always tells the story that it was not a great guitar. And they were like, you can go exchange it if you want. And he did. And he went and got us something a little bit nicer because he knew it was something he was going to want to spend some time on and some energy on. And I remember as a little kid kind of like creeping down the stairs when he'd start to play at night and I'd just listen around the corner and he started to invite me in and I would hum along and sing along. And there's lots of home movies of me just like singing while doing really anything. I never, never stopped singing. So did did they, did your parents get to a point where you became the uh, entertainment for when people came over? Did they ask you to, to, hey. (laughs) Absolutely. I have, I was, I mean, I don't think that they were making me the entertainment. I think I was forcing (laughs) entertainment on others, Um, but it was definitely encouraged. My parents are very supportive of my interest in the arts in all senses of it, Um, have always been incredibly encouraging. I've never, no one has ever offered a doubt on whether or not I should pursue my music or mm. uh this work as as a career either it's been an incredibly supportive um situation for me so i'm very grateful for that and i and i definitely pay a lot of um the credit to getting started with music to that experience with my father and and really like you know his tolerance of like sitting down there with me we'd run the same folk song over and over for hours oh, yeah. as i tried to figure out how to harmonize as like yeah. a 12 year old you know and um without that i think it i think it was an incredibly invaluable skill for me to learn let me ask you a question as you grew up because you know did you get any kind of pushback from your friends because i assume and it could be where you live but i assume they were probably into different music than you were I mean, yeah, but I th- I think I, in a lot of ways, was not following the traditional route anyway. Oh, obviously not. Yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. A, yeah a, a quirky dresser and, um, you know, that ex- extended into my, like, somewhat antisocial behavior, wanting to, like, read <laughs> sheet music during my free block, you know? Like, <laughs> I wanted to sit there at, like, no joke, in middle school, I would be caught, you know, holding my sheet music and sight singing to myself while everyone else was socializing and doing whatever i really wanted to experience this music and and for sure i mean there was tons of people who you couldn't pay them enough money to listen to the choral music that i wanted to listen to um and i remember freaking my friends out as a little girl like wanting to listen to this like old americana music where you're talking about cowboys stringing people up by the (laughs) neck and they were all like what is this like lillian this is very creepy um but i was just like i loved folk music i love storytelling music um that to me has always been like a tenant of what i listen to and it's something that my father and i share a lot of love for is really the narrative storytelling of folk music um, so between that and choral music, yeah, I think my taste was a little more eccentric than most of my friends. But I also was able to, you know, really narrow down the pool of people that I connected with um, through some of those things. Some of the people that I met in choir or through other musical veins have really been the friendships that have endured. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was a little different, but I, I'm really grateful for kind of for the the separation that that gives you of kind of exploring something without the the worries about what other people are thinking or their their well, I don't think I think it, as a creative person you got to let that go. I mean yeah, we we want really. to we want to um impress people I guess is the best word you, where you could say mm-hmm. and you want people to like your music but then after a while you realize you can't force it on people if they don't like it. And it's it's the same you you and the reason I ask questions like this is because the dozens of musicians I've interviewed everybody gets bit early. It's like a mm. disease we get mm. uh, and you can't <clears throat> and you can't get rid of it, you know, and people that in, in my age bracket are still I mean, you take the top notch people that are still performing. David Lee Roth of, you know, Van Halen turned 69 today. And you're thinking and he's still playing. I mean, take Paul yeah. McCartney hitting 80 and all that stuff. 
so when you get it, your disease is that. Yeah. And, and the one thing, <clears throat> and a lot of people can't understand if you're not, if you don't do that, because they don't, my wife was my manager of one of my bands once, and she said, you people are weird. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I wouldn't want to be friends with someone that's not weird, honestly. It's, <laughs> so, it's something so, I see as a valuable trait. Yeah. And I, and, and I think that's, that, and it is a valuable trait, but I can also understand you sitting there reading sheet music, because if you love something, you love it like that. And, like and the one thing yeah. about creativity is that it changes all the time. And as a guitar player for a long time, I, I'm one of those lead guitar player guys. You never stop learning. Yeah. That's the other, the other the great thing about it. And, and I know the article I read talked about your painted a pretty good picture of where you live. Mm -hmm. And the Appalachian Trail and the, the, the mountains up there in, in Burlington area and all that stuff. I would assume to a certain degree that had a huge influence. I mean, that's discussed about that. But, you know, Burling's not that big a city. You're kind of out in the country in the woods and all that stuff. Do you think you're in, in I, I know that's true, but I mean, do you, you really believe that probably had an effect on you and has the ability to kind of inform you or give you some ideas about what kind of music you want to write? Yeah, I, I would actually attribute the most credit to where I was from and where I was raised mm. in terms of um, my connection with music and and the subject matter of my music. So I grew up in a small town about an hour from Burlington, end of a dirt road, no neighbors, just like us in the forest. And we didn't have TV or anything like that. And my parents would always just go tell me to play outside. Um, and I grew up in kind of an untraditional setting in which, you know, kind of the the primary connection with any sort of like greater power was this concept of like, all right, Lillian, go play. Trees can talk. So can rocks. Go have fun. <laughs> go connect. And that was very much my idea. I'd go out and I'd assume there were fairies there and I'd assume that the trees could hear me. And I talked and I sang and I shared all of my hopes and dreams with all of those energies and entities out there. And And I think that that really was where I started singing was in this this safe woodland space that kind of cradled the sound and mountains that echoed and this beauty that really inspired me to to feel and want to articulate that back kind of in a practice of gratitude mm -hmm. um and the majority of my music has been written on that land and anytime that I you know, I'll be bringing a CD over there in a couple of days just to like leave it and show show the land like what we did. You know, this is all because it started there. Um, so I think, you know, even though I travel really often and I explore new places and I set up shop and home in different parts of the world and different parts mm -hmm. of the country, mm -hmm. Vermont and that, you know, that piece of land where I grew up is truly, you know, my heart. I'm completely, I cannot remove it from me. Um, and it's where I go in my mind when I need peace and when I need mm. creativity or solace. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you must be a very good guitarist, musician, because you went to Berkeley. You know, yeah, yeah. I did go to Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people and, and your degrees, which, of course, are really funny. I read that in my wife, anthropology and music. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah. Like, okay. so when, when well, was the bug that said, OK, I got to do this the rest of my life? Gosh, I mean, really, I think it sank in in high school for me when everyone else started ap applying to colleges, there was no part in my mind that understood a traditional career or education track. Uh, it just didn't resonate with me. It didn't make sense. It didn't feel like my path. I put all my eggs in one basket. I applied for Berkeley. I auditioned and I got in. Like that was all I wanted to do. I didn't even mess yeah. with any other schools because I knew that getting in wouldn't mean anything to me. It wasn't the path that I was going to choose. Um, so, you know, I think in that sense, that's kind of where the the ball started rolling. But I also think I haven't really taken it that seriously. I mean, I, I, I like to jump into the things that I have trust in and faith in and, mm -hmm. and believe to be like what is resonant with me. I think, you know, you get your energy back tenfold when you really, really commit it to something. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always had, you know, I said earlier, I've been really empowered by my parents and by my musical community. And um, I just, I felt the calling. So I went kind of into school with that energy 
And when I did eventually transfer to the University of Vermont to pursue a degree in anthropology with a minor in music, um, it was because my interest and my curiosity was drawing me not into really the technical aspects of music and, and music theory. I mm -hmm. was starting to just have questions about the world and the way that we perceive mm -hmm. it and the way that music impacts culture and the way that our experience impacts the way that we interpret art. All of that kind of falls under the lens of anthropology. And for me, that's where suddenly, you know, I was answering questions that was coming that were coming up in my own poetry and music was through an anthropological lens. Mm. So Concerned about your financial health? Then reach out to David Smith with Ever Jones. 469-372-1587. That's 469-372-1587. He can conduct business where you are. Get your financial health checkup with David Smith with Ever Jones. His number one concern is you. That's David Smith with Ever Jones. 469-372-1587. I kind of shifted uh, my interests there or like, you know, found a, a different way to explore my interests. Um, and from there, I moved into also additional mediums of artwork that kind of fell under anthropology. Photography has been a large yeah, I was going to ask you about well. that. There are some things talking about your multimedia situation. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious about that, too. Well, you know, the, and I think that that's important as a musician in the 21st century, you know, diversification of your art is a really big part of being someone who can be a, a self-employed musician. And so photography for me has been um, a really enabling art form to help me, you know, save money and, and record, you know, because making an album is not cheap. And so you have to really mm. like, you know, save and plan and, and make choices that are really going to benefit you as a musician. Um, so the mixture of those mediums has really allowed me to give the tenderness and time and attention to the music that I want to uh, and to not rush it and to not force it into things that it doesn't want to be. I want to give it time. I want to give it love. I want to give it the money that it deserves. Um, so, you know, the the idea that I get all of my money and only my money for music, I would be starved. Absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I, again, you're going to invest like any business. You're going to yeah, invest up yeah. front and you're going to work for that return and you're going to have trust in it and faith into it. And you're going to put your heart into it and there's going to be setbacks. But I believe really strongly that, you know, anything that is a self-investment is something worth investing in. Um the music for me has just, it has continued to give back. And I think, you know, if I had learned a lesson over and over and over again, that I wasn't getting fulfillment out of it, I wasn't getting any growth out of it, I would have stopped making music. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, a musician once told me that I were, I was, you know, hostessing in a restaurant when I was like 19. And right. the manager of the restaurant was a, a musician and managing a restaurant. And he said to me, don't do music unless you have to, because this lifestyle is really hard. Yes, it is. And and what I took from that was like, you know, anytime I have any questions of doubt, I go, OK, could I live my life without music in this point? And the answer has never been yes. Yeah. I, I need music. It is yeah. part of the catharsis. It is part of growth. It is part yeah. of understanding. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it wasn't really like a career choice. choice. I never went, I'm doing music and music alone. It was it's more just been. You know, I create something and I want to share it. Your music, though, it lends itself to more of a community spirit of doing music. You know, you don't, it's kind of like bluegrass music and Americana and folk music. It's not the kind of music that people have egos in. It's mm. just let's sit down and talk a story and play, you yeah. know, and, and not that, rock music i mean that's more of a singular thing you know i'm going to get up and do a lead break for 10 minutes and everybody's going to be looking at me which is okay mm. but still mm. it's not the same so you have different people and it's, and it's yeah it's it's doesn't drive you to drive you to i don't know whatever what that's what some music's supposed to be doing and i'm glad people like you exist i really am because the thing about it is I don't want that part of America to go away, mm. you know, because it's part of it. And I, and I bet if I was guessing, you spent some time doing historical studies of folk music, haven't you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, inadvertently, just by wanting to understand what these stories about and also just 
you know, through my father too, who is, um, has always been a fan of the history of the West and, uh, you know, a, a nautical, a lot of nautical themes. We've always been kind of, you know, into songs of, of sailors and ships. And mm -hmm. so I get, I think a lot of that interest from my father and, and this, um, you know, historical interest, uh, kind of runs in my family. And, and I think the storytelling aspect in music really helps get me on board with that, get me on board with wanting to learn about history and, and the human experience and, and writing about it. Like, you know, there, I just a couple months ago wrote a song that is not my own personal experience, but based on a historical story of, of two women in the frontier of the United States and, and, writing from their perspective, a narrative story that was based on, on a true story of their life was a way to transport me to really experience that, that time period to really have to vividly able, you know, to, you have to have a vivid picture of that experience in mm -hmm. your mind to be able mm -hmm. to write about it, to be able to condense that experience down to sentences that convey the message and the experience. Um, so yeah, you know, history, um, how it's being made, how it's changing, how it was, all kind of boil down into to the way that I can interpret music now and um, my own kind of fantasy spin on it too, because, you know, lots of things from our history are kind of gnarly um, and <laughs> oh, yeah. reimagining oh, yeah. them now, yeah. <laughs> reimagining them now with the, you know, my 21st century female perspective is right. something that I don't take for granted. Um, it's yeah. It's a beautiful opportunity to kind of, ingest critique and explore um our history and lens was being used when a lot of these things were being written and and listened to so when you got started on this album when and you worked on it obviously i could hear what i could tell you what you did you had to work had to go pay to play in the studio did you find a producer did people come to you how did you find the people to work with you had to find a producer obviously i know there's no in the, the information i read about you well, so, okay, so the, I'm the executive producer of the album. Okay. Uh, meaning that I was calling all the final shots. Um, I did work with another co-producer, Eli Gold, who was in the, the larger form of the performance band that I was working with at the time. Um, he, they play bass and, uh, and, and multiple other instruments, but we were kind of going into, um, the studio future fields in downtown Burlington, who I had connected with via a female rapper in town, actually. <laughs> uh, and she had been speaking really highly of them and had mentioned to me that they um, really wanted to get more women in the studio there mm. and that I should go check them out. Um, and I met with Dan and Eric, the people that run the studio there, and they were fantastic. Uh, and so sweet and so encouraging and so enthusiastic about the project um, really made it accessible to me and my vision um, and the, and the people in the community here, Eli and Ben and Connor and Marie and everyone that has been playing music with me and Phil, everyone uh, really came together to help record this project. And everyone was really, I, you know, I learned a lot through this process that I know what I want. I know what I'm listening for. I know what I want it to sound like. I know what the levels I want it to be. I know how much reverb I want. I, when I trust myself really know, and that was a really uh, beautiful experience to kind of go into it with a, a bit of timidness of like, oh, well, I need a co-producer because I don't really know what I'm doing and I don't know what I want. And in the end to be like, you know what, actually, I can make calls on all of this. I know exactly what I want. I co-mixed the whole thing with our mixing engineer as well, because I just I had a vision for it. And I. Um, I'm sure there will be critiques in the future about particular choices that I made, but they were the choices that I wanted to hear. I, you know, for me, like we were talking about earlier, you know, making music commercially viable or making it something that is an income for me is way lower on the list of importance than articulating the vision that I have. And so for me, prioritizing that vision and prioritizing what I want to hear is what I did with this record. And so being an executive producer was a really important role for me to have uh, because I'm really making this album for myself. Sure you are. Um, yeah, and and those who enjoy it, it's for them too, by extension. Um, so yeah, the process was honestly quite, it kind of just fell into line, um, connecting with the people at Future Fields and, and meeting other people who really understood the music and we're able to take, you know, I'm able to trust them as as a musician to take creative liberties that expand on this idea of mine. And 
that's a really powerful feeling when you hear someone play a solo over a track that you've written for the first time and it just like goes right to the heart of the feeling yeah they interpret yeah. your music in a way that you intended it um and i got really lucky just working with such an int- um an empathic and intuitive group of musicians. There's, there's some things, you know, I say this about going into the studio, some good things about it and bad things about it, mm-hmm. you know, and the bad thing is you're limited on time yeah. unless you have an unlimited mm-hmm. budget. So that that's the bad thing about it. But there are some things that go on and that are effective when you do it. And as a producer, the hardest thing for me, and I was in the studio last year doing a song and, um, was trying to convey to people what you hear in your head. Yeah. And and so you're absolutely right because, and, and it's, uh, did you teach yourself, well, which doll, which doll did you use? Did you use Pro Tools or what was the one that he was having? So I had an engineer um, okay. who was running the ship, you know, r- working all the equipment um, right. and I'm in the co-pilot seat kind of producing, making aesthetic right. choices and, and volume choices and, you know, things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Dan was our engineer and, uh, Dan is one of the people that owns future fields as well. So fantastically qualified individual, um, and was just, you know, having someone turn to you and ask if you like something really reminds you that, oh my God, I have an opinion in this. I can make choices here, (laughs) you know? Um, so that was a really beautiful thing to kind of feel that shift of being like, this is my vision. I get to choose. Um, and yeah, you know, there are the stressful moments when you're like, oh my God, we have like two more hours in here yeah, today. And yeah, I like, this yeah. is not coming together the way that I want it to. And in my experience, the way to get the results, especially when you're feeling stressed out about it, is to just release any expectation and that stranglehold on an idea and let the musician who is a fantastic musician who you mm-hmm. brought into this room because you trusted them, mm-hmm. let them just do whatever they want. Give them 20 minutes to do whatever they want. Yep. I guarantee you that's where the best take is going to come from. Yeah. When did you decide, though, that you had, you wanted to start this project? Did you already have enough tunes for the complete album when you went in? Yeah, to I did. Recording? I did. Um, the kind of impetus for the album was this voice memo that I received from Sophia, who we've talked about earlier from the track Sophia. Uh, The track that follows Sophia is the title track State of Romance. And it is uh, a song that I wrote to accompany this this voice memo that she sent me. That's the one I listened to. By the way, that's the one I listened to. That's the one. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Um, and, And Sophia kind of articulates to me that she sees in me this state of romance and something in that wording like clicked like nothing before and i thought that's the name of my album that's the concept that's what i've been moving through in my life for the last two years that's what i've been understanding that's how i've been perceiving the world sophia you have like turned the light bulb on (laughs) um and so i went home and i put i put the songs in order and i just i knew in that moment i started looking into recording it um So, you know, it was a really kind of immediate aha moment. You know, I didn't, I wasn't trying to do anything really. It just, it came. That was the moment it came. Yeah. And then it took you a year and a half to do the whole project, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, I think the actual recording of it was about a year. And then we've kind of been like sitting on it and working on the, you know, CD design or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and mixing, yeah. yeah. And I wanted a big hand in mixing because it is a huge, it is... It's yours. It is. It's like choosing what lens you're going to shoot a picture on. It's like it is so important to the framing and the experience of the listener. Um, and as someone who also, you know, I, I have a lot of um, choral backing on a lot of my tracks. I, mm. you know, use my my background in choral music to and, and harmonizing to build, you know, lush layered vocals under a lot of these songs to kind of give it that padding without having to write really complex, you know, string parts, which we have a little bit of that, but I, I really wanted to, you know, when I'm alone, it's me humming, it's me ooing and aahing and singing to myself. (laughs) And I really wanted to make sure that was part of the essence of the album. Um, So yeah, that's kind of where we landed. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And have uh, a good day. Yeah. And we'll be in touch. See you later. Wonderful. Great to meet you, Rick. Right, Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. 
Well, thanks so much for stopping by and listening to my interview with Lillian Ledbetter. For more information about Lillian, just simply go to her website at lillianledbettermusic.com. It's spelled L-E-A-D-B-E-T-T-E-R. And as always, thank you, David Smith, for supporting our channel. He's with Edward Jones. Always reach out to him if you need some assistance. And for more information about The Trout Show, you can always find everything you need to know about YouTube, about podcasts, music, everything at thetroutshow.com. And so until next time, remember, people, it's only rock and roll, but I love it. See ya.